Hi everyone and welcome to the Big Data Deep Dive with The Cube on EMC TV. I'm Richard Schlesinger and I'm here with tech industry entrepreneur and Wikibon analyst Dave Vellante and Silicon Angle CEO and Editor-in-Chief John Furrier. So welcome to you guys. Um, I have a prediction to make that uh, this segment will be of great interest to our audience because we're talking about predicting the future and that really is the goal, right? That's what big data, strip away all the other stuff, that's what big data is about, right? Yeah, and we talk a lot about this being the tip of the iceberg. We're now at a point, Richard, where we can predict the future. And now it becomes, I've said a number of times, we're in the early innings. Now it becomes a matter of, okay, what do we do with that information? How do we mobilize and take action in an anticipatory way? And how big of a, an issue is that in the community? It's, it's the number one thing we're seeing right now. We're seeing analytics as the hottest trend in tech right now. And underneath that, if you think of it as like a car, under the hood is a lot of tech geek stuff going on. But what analytics really means is that you can get real-time information at the right time delivered to people. So whether it's a predicting the, the landing of a hurricane could have saved New Orleans. I mean, this is the kind of impact that big data can, can provide. Well, because if you think about it, I mean, sifting through mountains of data on all sorts of things um, can help predict uh, economic, social, or you know, even natural trends. But if we were able to predict natural disasters, right, if we were able to predict earthquakes, for instance. That, that, now we're talking about not just making money, we're talking about saving lives, and that's huge. So look at uh, this story that EMC TV did a little while back about a group of scientists who were trying to predict volcanic eruptions. The destructive force of Mother Nature. <coughs> Deadly, indifferent, overwhelming. But these natural disasters can generate massive quantities of data. Data we can use to mount our first line of defense. This is Popocatepetl. Located just 40 miles southeast of Mexico City, it's one of North America's most active volcanoes. Volcano expert Carlos Gutierrez Martinez is alarmed by Popocatépetl's recent spike in seismic activity. This is a fragment thrown away from the volcano during a minor explosion. He warns that this volcano could be building up to a major eruption. If this uh, volcano explodes, it can uh, scatter all those debris and fragments up to 30 miles to the south. For Andre Castillo Castro and his family, a major eruption could mean total annihilation. They live in Santiago Salicintla, one of several small villages near the base of the volcano, right in the path of destruction. In the case of a big, big explosion from the volcano, we could have something similar to the St. Helen volcano. Despite the danger, Andre says most villagers won't uproot their families or abandon their farms until they're ordered to evacuate. That means thousands of lives could depend on Mexican authorities knowing when this volcano might be ready to blow. This is the National Center for Disaster Prevention, or Cenebret, in Mexico City. It's their job to inform the government when an evacuation may be necessary. Researchers here rely on a constant stream of data to tell them if events like this are just a harmless release of pressure or the beginnings of a catastrophic volcanic eruption. If we see all the bars going up, it means that there's a lot of seismic energy being released. The volcano is really trembling a lot. Cenepred works with the National Autonomous University of Mexico, or UNAM, to operate a network of remote sensors and digital cameras on and around the volcano. We have collected a lot of information uh, related with the seismicity, the ash emissions, the explosions. The remote sensors feed researchers thousands of data points per second, enabling 24-7 data analysis that can sense a pending eruption in real time. 
now we can look at much more information we could pull it out right away and we could do a lot of analysis with the, all the data information that we have right now we can make definitely better decisions fortunately for the residents of santiago salitzintla any decision to evacuate will be driven by data but at least for now researchers say it's safe for families like the Castillo Castros to get on with their lives near the base of the volcano. So the best part about the work that they're doing down there in Mexico is that they're, they're not only talking about predicting individual volcanic eruptions, but they're gathering a database of the behavior of volcanoes that you know could be used in 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 further research. So it's really, there's a lot going on there. There, uh, there are major breakthroughs that are possible um, in that science. And I, I guess there are also major breakthroughs. We've talked a little bit about outer space. Um, but you guys don't only talk to uh, data scientists. You talk to rocket scientists. Um, and you've done that recently, so tell me about that. Well, yeah, also, we've also recently saw the actual last shuttle with NASA fly over Silicon Valley, and it was a great, great fun day. It went out in front of the Google Plex with all the other geeks in Silicon Valley. And it didn't bother them it, that that was 1960s technology. Yeah, it was just was like, you know, watching that. historic, the final, like, victory lap of NASA. And then NASA prepares to go to the next level, and I think, Dave, that was exciting to, to talk to all the people we talked with at NASA. Yeah, well, we talked to, to NASA on the Cube, uh, Chris Matman who's a computer scientist at, at NASA and JPL, the Jet Propulsion Labs, talks about how they essentially are capturing the universe and what else they're doing with big data around weather and other instrumentation. So take a look at this. Welcome back to theCUBE. We're here at Hadoop Summit in San Jose. Uh, beautiful, sunny San Jose, as far as I know. It was nice this morning. I haven't been outside in a while, but... Uh, uh, we're it's still very nice. Jeff. Yes, I've got my uh, co-host, Abi Mehta, filling in. Thank uh, you. From Traseda. Glad a guess, to have him A guest co-host? A guest co-host. You know, we're, we're trying new things Fantastic. on theCUBE all the time. Uh, and our guest now is Chris Matman from uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA. Very interesting stuff. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, nice to meet you. Welcome to theCUBE. Uh, it's a painless, painless environment. No no worries at all. So, you haven't uh, hurt me yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just coming from uh, a talk you gave. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, just coming from talk. Why don't we share a little bit with our audience kind of what you, what you were uh, talking about, and then maybe we can go into some of the use cases, things you're doing at NASA. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I basically was talking about um, some of the challenges, like some of our big data scenarios that we have at, um, at NASA, like, for example, the Square Kilometer Array, which is an international project, the next generation radio astronomy instrument that's going to generate about 700 terabytes of data per second. Um, oh, my which, God. Which we really don't understand. That, that's, say that again. Seven hundred terabytes per second. Yep, per second. So that, that's that's fifteen times more than the uh, Large Hadron Collider. Yeah, and your math is better than mine, so because <laughs> you wow. came up with that on the fly. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it's the largest. I mean, it's we don't know what to how to, how to even deal with that. There's got to be yeah, a decade, wow. a decades of research to support that. So I was talking about projects like that, the U.S. National Climate Assessment, a lot of the work that we're doing related to that, and just trying to motivate the development of technologies and the use of technologies like Hadoop. And, and, yeah. and, and other so, things. So, you know, obviously NASA has a rich heritage of, uh, you know, from in the uh, technology world, developing technologies and that eventually kind of make their way out uh, into the wider world. So, uh, talk a little bit about some of the experiences you've had and how they would relate to some of our audience who maybe, you know, they're not at NASA, they're at, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a, a little less sophisticated uh, organization. Exciting job, yeah. You guys are giving us too much credit. Um, <laughs> no, for us, like, I bet you it's pretty similar even to business or to, you mm -hmm. know, other IT industries. Uh, you know, for us, it's just different data file formats and it's different things that are generating the data. You know, a lot of people or a lot of companies like Yahoo or whatever, the data is being generated by users, like hundreds of millions of users that do clicks or whatever. But you can think of that in a way as something that is being observed and then some derived analysis that happens from that. For us, the thing that's doing the observing a lot of times, at least at JPL and at NASA, are our remote sensing instruments mm -hmm. that look at the Earth, that try and measure different parameters. You know, they're looking at surface albedo, you know, reflectance, and so, and they're looking at the measurement of, or of snow in a particular pixel of the Earth, you know, yeah. and then it's basically the, the things that are different are the data file formats, the, you know, the tools that operate on them. A lot of people here in the Hadoop community are, you know, they're R users, they're Python right. users. We're not as sophisticated oh, a lot within, you know, NASA because a lot of the people that write R algorithms and R codes to crunch on the data, they're scientists that aren't trained programmers. You know, uh, they pick up a little bit of programming, you know, along the way. 
And so that's those are the main sort of differences. The differences are in kind of the variety, the velocity, the typical big data, right. you know, things, but also just in the nuts and bolts. But in the end, it's the same thing. It's generating data, gener uh, generating, you know, in our case, files or records, processing them, getting some insight. Our insight go into policymakers. They go into science research. Right. They go into monetary decisions and mm -hmm. things like that. But. Uh, so for you know for us laymen, could you maybe uh, give us a couple of examples of where big data analytics has really had a you know an impact? Kind of give us the end result. What are some of the some of the insights maybe you've gleaned, or some of the some of the uh, uh, you know analytics you've done that are really you know a, a lay person, a non NASA person could actually uh, understand? Sure. So I mean, I will give you one example uh, by a guy named Dr. Tom Painter, who is one of my inspirations at JPL. He's a snow hydrologist. Basically, what he's he's working with the Bureau of Reclamation. He's working with the water managers in the Western U.S and he's trying to figure out how to generate more accurate measurements of a snow melt and, uh, and, and snowpack so that we can get better measurements of water so that we understand, that water managers understand how much water to release for mm -hmm. the coming season. Or mm -hmm. just people know what to predict in terms of um, uh, recreation and parks. Like parks and recreation is a $10 million industry, you know, in Colorado and the western U.S., just people going and skiing and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't have snow around, people yeah. can't do that. And a lot of people that are in the money-making profit stream for that, you know, hurt. Yeah. So being able to generate more accurate measurements of snow and being able to use data systems and big data and, predict and analytics for that is just something where I think we're we're seeing a lot of value on. It's contributing to the U.S. National Climate Assessment. Wow. You know, it's going into all of the climate reports and so forth. So that's that's something that's really fresh in our minds. So, so, so you think, uh, to be a little bold, that big data can help solve global warming? It's a big data problem? Uh, I absolutely think it's a big data problem. And I will be bold, and I think it can do that. Mm. Yeah, I think basically most of the work, you know, for running climate models is you know, shipping data around, shipping right. computation around, all of the types of things, and then making, like you said, your predictive analytics was really great because a lot of NASA research is retrospective, trying to learn a model from what is already existent. And people are kind of gun shy to make predictions a lot of right. times, because especially when they deal with policy and money and things <laughs> like that. Point. But I think I'll just make a statement. I think that that's a big data problem, and that's what we need to get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. I think you know, the predictive analytics is really where uh, is really the next. And the, really the next step um, rather than just looking back mm -hmm. and you know this as well as anybody obviously so uh, all right great well thanks so much uh, Chris for coming on really appreciate it thanks guys uh, inside the cube uh, we will be right back in a moment with our next guest so uh, you know listening to this guy uh, Mr. Matman or Dr. Matman probably I'm wondering uh, how, how what's the relationship in 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 the in your world between the data scientists and the other kinds of scientists, the, the rocket scientists, the volcanic scientists. Uh, is, there a, is there a close relationship? Well, increasingly, those two worlds are coming together. You're seeing you know, data hackers and statisticians and business analysts essentially become data scientists. Um, what's interesting about that segment to me is that you've got a situation where you're taking a lot of data, but you're making inference out of that data. In the old world, prediction was about building models, and those models were you know, the be-all, end-all, whatever the model said was the answer. And now it's about taking sort of fuzzy data and drawing inference from that, and that's different. But also the real-time nature of the big data thing would make it hard to have, you know, models that you don't change, because things change. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of things going on with that. One is, on the personnel side, it's going from PhD math geek, because um, there's a lot of math and science involved in a lot of this big data stuff, to more of the general purpose, common person, analyst type, or any, any employee or any individual for that matter. We show the examples there. The trend is clearly moving towards abstracting away the complexity so that it's easy to use, so that anyone can be a data scientist and Because that's value. how change comes, right? Yeah. You, you have to put the, the, the power of the data in the hands hands of somebody who knows that field, whatever the field that's is. Happening that's right happening right now. Right. It's happening right now, and that's exciting, and that's the most exciting thing. And we've seen this before with Intel. They made processors you know, faster, but no one really knew how a processor worked. It just worked. That's what's going on with big data, and you're seeing that happen fast. And there's a big discussion around you know, domain expertise. Can the data essentially replace the domain expertise? Right now, we're in a world where you can't take the human out of the equation, but there's conversation about eventually, will you be able to do that? That's another wow, very... Wow. No, scary you're, thought. You're making me nervous here. <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, there's, there's a lot of work uh, going on in uh, climate uh, research, as, as, as Mattman talked about. Um, we found this company, there's, a, there's a, a company doing some really interesting stuff on, on climate research called Three Tier that is using, I mean, really decades of data to, uh, to try to help companies make investments and make decisions in what kind of 
energy production to, to invest in, uh, and what's, you know, how the climate affects those decisions. And we did a little story on them, so, so take a look at this. Renewable energy is generally driven by natural phenomena like uh, sunshine, wind, rain. They show up when Mother Nature decides to deliver them and not when you necessarily need them. It's very challenging to commit to many, many millions of dollars or even billions of dollars of an energy portfolio without really understanding the risk associated with having a less than normal windy year or having more sun than average. Three Tier provides our customers with a way to manage the risk around their wind, solar, and hydropower projects. We do data everywhere. We have 40 years of climate data for the entire globe. So every corner of the globe, wherever you might imagine even putting a wind farm or a solar plant. So we distill all of that data down to the critical decisions that the customers need to make. Do I buy now? Do I sell now? Do I invest in this? A yes, no answer. For us as a company, even though we know that at the end of the day, we may be sending out something that is a few thousand bytes to the client, we may be churning through many terabytes of data to get there. The data really piles up. Our supercomputing cluster is typically putting out about a terabyte a day of data that we actually retain and keep. The MC Isilon system provides us with reliability, scalability, and performance that gives me access to everything I need out of a storage system. We have this long laundry list of science we'd like to say, oh yeah, you know, we'll include that someday, but increasingly that day is like today or tomorrow. Mother Nature has an infinite supply of data for us, and to me, the more we can get our hands on that data and make use of it, the more we can work with Mother Nature in terms of providing a sustainable future. One nice thing is, of course, Three Tier is a pretty long-time EMC customer. They're using a lot of the, uh, a lot of the hardware, and uh, uh, so it's good to see that they're doing that they're doing well. Um, you know, th and they're they're talking about stuff that's hot now. I mean, they're talking about renewable energy, you know, hydro and wind. You saw in that. Um, so it strikes me that climate is a is a really fertile ground for for this type of of research, this type of science. What, what else are you guys hearing about what's going on in, in, in that universe? Well, you mentioned it. I mean, obviously, the climate control thing and renewable energy and the space exploration, I think that's all going to come together, and some of the smart people think that's part of the all-one equation. But what's out in the fringe out right now, I, I call the lunatic fringe out, where it's <laughs> kind of ha really happening, is agricultural investments. So there's a new trend in Silicon Valley that's getting a lot of traction recently, and that's in heavy-duty tech investments in agriculture. To do what? To help with uh, farming, uh, make it clean, clean food, if you will, uh, not clean energy, but a lot of advancements on you know, agriculture, farmland, and using technology to manage soils, manage crops, all kinds of new. Get more out of your farmland. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty big business. Billions of dollars being invested every year in this area in agriculture. Lots more to talk about. I wish we had more time, but I really appreciate as always, you guys stopping by, talking about the agricultural thing will be something to watch, I would think. Yeah. Because um, that's, that's another, if you'll pardon the expression, fertile area for, uh, for investment. Um, so thanks again to both of you guys yeah. for, for stopping by and giving us your insight and your really deep knowledge in, in all this stuff. We, of course, have more installments of the uh, Big Data Deep Dive coming up. So stay tuned to the conversation with my new best friends from theCUBE right here on EMC TV.